Howdy folks, and welcome to the Six Ranch Podcast. Today we are talking about stone flies with Kyle Bratcher of Six Foot Flies and Paul Pagano of Flyside Angling. If you haven't already listened to the Mayfly and Caddis episodes, you might go back and give those a rip first. The stonefly is usually the largest bug that trout consume, and the dry fly opportunities can be nothing short of amazing. For anglers who take one trip a year to fish, many of them try to schedule it during a time when stoneflies are hatching, and for good reason. To make this episode as challenging as possible, we recorded it while fishing for kokanee on our local lake. Chaos ensued. Welcome to the show. How many kokanees? Four. Four kokanees? Four kokanees. Okay, let's get your wire set up here so you guys can... Not trip over each other. Go catch fish if needed. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with the Six Ranch Podcast. We're out here on Wallowa Lake doing a little kokanee fishing this evening. I have with me Kyle Bratcher. If you haven't listened to the previous podcasts on entomology and how that pertains to fly tying and fly fishing, you might want to catch up on the Mayfly and the Caddis episode. Tonight we're going to be talking about stone flies. I also have with me Paul Pagano from Flyside Angling. Paul showed up briefly for the Mayfly podcast, but stone flies are a pretty important bug to you mm. in, uh, in your fishing for sure. So I think it's really cool that you were able to come out here and fish with us this evening and see if we can't turn something up and uh, talk about stoneflies. So similar format, Kyle, let's start with the egg. Oh, starting with the eggs. So the eggs are either going to be laid on the surface of the water or, again, stuck to some kind of emergent vegetation, uh, depending on the species. So those eggs are going to take... Um, Oh, a few months to a year to hatch again. So they do that same diapause that a mayfly will do. Um, They have the ability, if it's really cold, to um, just pause out. Or if conditions aren't right, they'll just uh, quit developing for a little while. So um, typically, though, in normal conditions, you're looking at a couple months to hatching out. And then then those uh, stoneflies will go into the larval phase or the nymph phase. Nymph phase. Nymph phase. And uh, stonefly is going to have around 1,000 eggs, from what I understand. Is Mm -hmm. that, that about right? Yep. And these are fairly large insects as adults, and we'll get to that during the adult phase. But it's interesting that a mayfly being so much smaller comparatively, you know, can have 3,000 eggs, whereas a stonefly has 1,000. That really says a lot about their viability in offspring, doesn't it? Yeah, and if you talk, look, start looking at, like, the spring hatching stoneflies, like the squalas that they'll call them, those females, you can actually see that egg sac hang off the back, and a lot of the fly patterns out there have that incorporated into it, the little black ball on the back end of them, so mm-hmm. to represent that egg. And then what's going on in the nymph phase? So the nymph phase, they're long-lived critter. They're going to go from, well, depending on where they are, a few months to four years uh, before they decide they want to be an adult. And it really, again, kind of like the mayflies, it's going to depend on... Uh, where they're at. In colder climates, it's going to take a lot longer. Snow melt, snow-driven snow systems, it's going to take longer. If you go down to the tropics, they're going to be a little faster. What's interesting is that the there's stoneflies in the northern and southern hemisphere, and they're almost completely different from each other as far as taxonomy goes. In what ways are they different? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to, to pronounce the two because one starts with arcto and the other one starts with antarcto for northern and southern (laughs) hemispheres the antarcto everything that follows those sounds in that word gets real scary for me i I didn't even try and say it in my head so did you have any experience with those when you went to argentina i kicked around and saw some stoneflies Mm -hmm. um just in the nymph format so the time of year that i was down there and, and where i was for folks who don't know, it was called Peninsula Mitre on Tierra del Fuego. And that's this peninsula that is the south, southeasternmost point of um, the island, which makes it the southernmost point of the entire continent. And it was something like 7,600 miles from home. So if I'd gone to Antarctica, I would have been closer to home than where I was <laughs> in Argentina. There's penguins there. It's, it's wild. It's a different type of fishing. Mm-hmm. But there were some some nymphs that I definitely considered to be stoneflies there, mostly based on identification with claws. Hmm. So a stonefly nymph has two claws, 
most mayfly nymphs only have one claw. And stonefly nymphs um, have a really high oxygen requirement. So they have to be in a swifter part of a stream, generally speaking. And because of that, they're, al- they're also bad swimmers. So they need to be able to hold on to rocks. That's why they evolved with mm-hmm. an extra claw to be able to hold on. Sure. So six legs, 12 claws. Mm-hmm. And so if, you, if you're out on the stream and you're looking at bugs, then you pull up a, a, a nymph and it has three tails, it is surely a mayfly. Um, if it has two tails, then it's it's either a stonefly or mayfly, and then you got to do a little further investigation. Gotcha. But so that's an easy way to to know if you're looking at a mayfly versus a stonefly right off the bat, and then you might have to dig a little deeper. So, okay. But and they might molt thirty six times. Yeah, it's a lot, and you know that's a lot of growth. You know, and I mean, but we're talking about some big bugs. You know, we talk about salmon flies. We're talking about a pretty big critter and you know obviously anglers really like those guys so but that's takes quite a while for a bug like that in cold water to grow to that kind of size and a lot of molts so so we've we've now molted up to uh three dozen times getting bigger and bigger and bigger how do we break out of this nymph phase into adulthood and grow wings do you want to talk about what they eat first yeah let's talk about what they eat so they can be they're kind of like mayflies, um, but since they do get quite a bit bigger, they can be a little more predatory, and they will eat mayflies and caterflies. And um, I've seen I've seen salmon carcasses covered in uh, big stonefly nymphs, salmonfly nymphs. Uh, so they they can eat a variety of things, and we'll go back to that parrot fighting and the um, detritus. They'll eat they'll eat both of those. Um, so again, detritus is basically dead laying on the bottom of the river that's either been sloughed off of an animal or it's decomposing and then paraphyton is living stuff like algae and diatoms and bacteria so but they'll scrape that they'll eat some of that stuff and then they'll actually even eat some plant matter depending on what's around so pretty omnivorous depending on the species you're talking about and they'll eat other nymphs yep they'll eat other nymphs so so some of these stonefly nymphs get pretty darn big you know they'll be the size of uh size of your finger at least the, the first two knuckles of your finger. Pretty pretty big bug, not great swimmers, good crawlers, like to live under rocks. So if you want to go see if there's stoneflies in your stream, picking up big rocks that are kind of in the current and then lifting them up to see if they're either attached to the bottom of the rock or hiding in the substrate beneath it is a good way to, to find them. If you find a real pale colored one, um, that's probably one that's freshly molted. So he's growing his new exoskeleton. I've found a couple of those that are like a watery mustard color, Mm -hmm. but definitely a cool bug to go out and look for with kids. You know, there's no fear. They're, they're neat. It's this entry into this magical world that exists in the rocks of a river, but do they tolerate pollution very well? Uh, They're not great with pollution. Kind of the three bugs we've talked about so far typically aren't. And where you find the diversity of all three of those together is where your water quality is best. Um, and diversity in species. So as you move into systems that are more polluted, you're going to see fewer and fewer of those, and it'll kind of push out towards caddis, and you'll have, and caddis will kind of be the last one of those three to hang on, and then you'll get into a lot of coronamids and the beetle-type bugs, the okay boatmen and that type of thing. So I, I read that there's also some stoneflies that, uh, that never leave the water. They don't have a winged phase. Mm-hmm. And that makes them one of the only insects to spend their entire life in the water. Mm-hmm. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. There's a few even that all that are unwinged that will leave the water, but they're completely wingless and they can't fly around. So they'll actually go to a terrestrial phase also, which is interesting. That's kind of a bummer when you look at these mayflies that have this super exciting end to their life. You know, they've <laughs> been duking it out, not getting eaten by everything in the world for a couple of years. And then they at least get to fly around, have a couple adult stages, a little romantic encounter. And then, um, <laughs> then they die. Uh, stonefly really misses the boat out on some of that if, if they're not a winged variety. Okay. So in adulthood, how, how are they, how are they transitioning? What does a stonefly hatch look like? Yeah. Typically a stonefly hatch is a nymph crawling out onto the rocks uh bridge abutments are a great place to see where stoneflies have hatched out a lot of bridge abutments depending on the time of year you can go up to it and you can see it'll just be covered in husks 
Um, the, so they've left their old nymphal stage behind right there. So they typically crawl out at night and get up onto vegetation, rocks, um, bridge abutments, like I said, and they'll hatch out of that husk and then they'll sit there overnight and dry and kind of mature. Who's that? I don't know. Somebody in a canoe is <laughs> waving at us. Oh, it's Rob and Andy. Oh, Rob and Andy. They'll get your sleeping bag with you, too. Not those. <laughs> Stoneflies. Stoneflies. <laughs> Perfect timing. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Do you remember that trip, James, when we were covered in them down at Bear Creek for three days? We're recording a podcast. Hi. Uh, okay, where were we? <laughs> yeah, that got completely f***. <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to, we'll get back to your, your part of the story there here in a little bit, Paul. Right. Um, we'll just kind of breeze through the rest of this um, life cycle stuff. Yeah. Okay, so as adults, they've got one phase where, where they're flying around. And how yeah. long does that phase last? A couple weeks. A couple weeks? Yeah. So that's, but that's a one-up on the mayfly. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a couple weeks. Um, you know, and they'll hang out on the vegetation a lot during the day. Around here, we'll see that golden stone fly hatch come off and lots of lots of flight time in the late afternoon. Yep. Um, and, you, you know, when I see stone flies, it seems to be they're either being blown off. When I see stone flies on the water, they're either being blown off of trees by the wind or they're out laying eggs, typically. Right. And they're depositing eggs in riffles as they bounce along. And you'll see those females kind of flutter up in that, that late afternoon, evening sun. They'll get 20, 30 feet off the river and then dive down so that they can break through, lay their eggs, and then get off before a fish eats them, which really lends its way to the type of presentation that you want to have if you're throwing dry flies. You know, you want that nice settling effect so that a trout can see it when it's in the air and start making his mind up to make the move. So getting into the fly tying aspect of things, what materials work well for stonefly nymphs oh for stonefly nymphs you know they're tied a lot like everything else uh it's a dubbing with a rib you typically want to have some kind of wing case like uh either turkey turkey's kind of been the traditional thing uh in the past uh there's a lot of things out there now like thin skin i've taken to using a material called swiss straw that i really like it's easy to work with um it looks good you know something over the back and I've started actually running that material all the way from tail to head. Because um, if you look at these stonefly nymphs, a lot of times they're lighter on the bottom than they are on the top. or they're, So they're slightly different color on each side. So I've started running that all the way to the top. Um, rubber legs, lots of hackle, something that looks leggy, looks buggy. Start talking about things like a Pat's rubber leg. All it is is chenille and rubber legs. Super easy to tie. But <laughs> that looks, rod just got hit. Looks like a stonefly. Come on back, little baby. We got Paul uh, trying to fight fight through his microphone boom to get to a white claw over here. Is that a mango white claw? You know it. <laughs> Is that your go-to? No, I like watermelon ones, but you can't find them individually. You got to buy them in the twelve pack. You only get three. Okay. Uh, that's a new one. White claw problems. Yeah, white claw. <laughs> what about you, Paul? Tying uh, stonefly nymphs. What kind of materials you like to look for? I don't use a lot of rubber legs. I know they're effective. I just would rather go with natural materials i think they're easier for me to work with personally um goose biots for your your tails chenille um peacock hurl for a body is always kind of a go-to hmm. you know your ribbing whatever you want to do for that and then you know <clears throat> like kyle was saying synthetic materials for your case and i like to come over the top of it and then finish it off with like loon uv you know so you put a little hot spot in the top of it with um you know, like lateral scale or flash boo or whatever you want to come to the top. I like lateral scale more than flash boo. It's kind of got like a bluing effect in the water versus a pink. And um, as far as your legs, you know, you can do anything. If you're going natural, partridge is a good way to go. And then come over the top of it with your case after you dub up the body, dub up the thorax, kind of spread those legs out. And when you bring it over the top, finish it off on the bead, it just kind of lays down. You can, you know, kind of got to work it down a little bit as you're finishing off the fly, but... I find, I've got one in here, I'll show you that I tied it up earlier, but I find that that gives a, a real buggy, leggy effect in the water, but honestly, I don't think they care. A Pat's rubber legs with chenille is, is just as effective as anything natural. It's more like what you're into tying and showing clients to, you know, they're, a lot of these guys are really into 
tying, they're just getting into it. And so to show them something that's all natural materials with maybe just a little bit of synthetic materials, you know, kind of a good way to just to. And one of the flies I've been tying up for Paul a lot lately is a 20 inch stone. He turned, kind of turned me on to that one and um, had me tie some up for him. And it, for the legs, you actually tie like a, a soft hackle in by mm -hmm. the tip, tip. like a, either a partridge hackle or an India hem back, tie it in by the tip, lay, lay in towards the tail, and then you fold it over to the front and tie it off at the back of the head and it and it those all fibers all kind of lay back but they're all right on the back and i've found myself uh using that technique more and more it's easy to do um and it's quicker than than spinning your your hackle and it looks real leggy so i put a hot spot in there just for fun but i think that's what you're talking about right kyle just kind of the way it comes down tight on the tip wrap yeah. it and it drops so paul's busted out his fly box here and we're looking through his nymphs that is sort of like a prince nymph except it's it's bigger than most princes you're going to run across and it's got a got a bunch of partridge up there around the collar mm -hmm. and you can see that i tied in that little hot spot there oh. that lateral scale then i just finished it off with some uv it's not the prettiest fly ever i just kind of cranked it out right before we started doing this and what is a hot spot it's just anything fluorescent that kind of might catch their attention a little bit you know you can do it with your you can do it with your thread too. You don't always have to use like a dubbing or any synthetic material like lateral scale or flash taboo, but it's just something that might grab their eye a little bit. Just a, a little piece of bright color. Something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, usually towards the head. And we talked about that a little bit in the Mayfly episode about, you know, if, you're, if your fish aren't that picky and maybe your water's colored up a little bit and it's not a, one of these super famous hammered fisheries that those hot spots can be pretty effective yeah. and you move off to places that are pressured real hard and i, I go away from them a little For more sure. and go to more towards the natural stuff but those hot spots are real popular nowadays and a lot of those competition anglers out there are using tag nymphs and stuff that are essentially just another hot spot so. mm -hmm. okay so because they're crawling out to the banks there's not really an emerger stonefly pattern that's important would you guys agree with that? There's, I've there's seen not. some in the stores, and they look all funky, and they're, like, all humped up, and yeah. it looks like the stonefly that's maybe broken loose from a rock. Yeah. I haven't found those to be effective. No, if anything, it's probably a size size dilemma, you know? If you think that they're just starting to hatch, I, I will throw smaller smaller dries a little bit. and the season goes on, I'll start throwing a little bit bigger bigger dries for them as they just grow. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you can fish a drown, mm -hmm. a drowned adult pattern. You know, a stimulator that you just didn't grease up very much, or mm -hmm. um, maybe not a stimulator. But well, yeah, there's a lot of things. Certainly, out there. if you, if you're below some fast moving water, some places where that water can envelop an adult stonefly, drown him, and get him down to a fish's level, that's a good time to throw a yeah. throw a dry fly and get some split shot involved, mm -hmm. or or something or. Uh, Nice heavy stonefly nymph with a tungsten head that's gonna it just drops where that fly just can't quite mm -hmm. float it or it just barely floats it and mm -hmm. you know you can still see that fly getting sunk a little bit and that's where uh you know maybe some kind of cider on it is helpful just a little piece of bright foam that mm -hmm. you can see from a distance so if, when it does go under you can still see how it's reacting but all right so now we're moving on to adult stonefly patterns and we don't have the spinner phase we don't have the done phase like we do with mayflies. We just have this uh, this adult phase of a stonefly's life, and we can kind of break it down into healthy adults and dead adults. And most stonefly dry patterns are, are healthy adults that are egg laying or have gotten blown off of the vegetation and have hit the water. So, what are some of you guys' go to dry fly patterns um, for stones? So go-to confidence flies for me, always a stimmy, stimulator for those that are new to it, and chubby Chernobyl, purple. You know, I think you tied me up some pretty hot pink ones this last year, chubbies, or maybe for Montana, but those were effective too. Uh, but purple chubbies and and great big stimulators. So in, in a variety of colors, you know, you get a good golden hatch coming off, you know, lighten up your colors for sure on that and adjust accordingly. What's a What's a golden? Golden stonefly hatch. So... One of our big four, we get our goldens here, and uh, it's a lighter colored stonefly adult, and uh, just your tying to that. Versus a lot of stimulators you might see in the store, if you walk into a fly shop, most of them are going to be geared a little bit more towards um, salmon flies, a little bit more orange and reds in them. But those work too, you know. A lot of times it's just a profile thing for them looking up. 
Everybody likes to fish a big giant salmon fly, but mm-hmm. I honestly think the golden stones are more prolific across the West typically. Sure. Um, you know, there's places you see some insane salmon fly hatches, but the goldens I think are just more consistent overall. Given the time of year, I think flows are more consistent, less flashy. And Yep, they also know. hatch just a little bit later. Um, we see golden stone flies hatching, you know, 10 to 14 days later in similar elevations than the salmon fly. And a lot of times that salmon fly, if he's coming off on June 12th or 14th, you're looking at high water throughout, throughout most of the Intermountain West. Um, and yeah, you can go out there and catch fish and it's great and there's these giant bugs all over the place. But you can probably have some better fishing if you targeted a golden stonefly hatch um, a couple weeks later as so those rivers start to drop. Yeah, I'm one of the. I'm not gonna put. I'm not gonna put the particular river on blast, but um, I fished one. I fished one river that had a great salmon fly hatch on it that was spring fed, and it was it was May June is when they were coming off. Interesting. And it, it was real fun because it was totally different. So the water was still clear, um, but they were there and the water temps were there for them, and so. You didn't have to worry about that water being colored up or blown out or anything. And you getting hit on in this one, Kyle? Am I seeing things? Okay. No, it's 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 acting funky. We might be trolling a little baby fish on there, but maybe Mac and I'll come up and eat him, and then we'll have a real rodeo. So I I love a foam pattern, it's like the chubby Chernobyl, um, and I like I like black foam with a purple body, a flashy purple body, and then a big white wing with a little bit of flash in that wing. And I think that having a couple strands of flashaboo in that white wing makes a tremendous difference for those fish's ability to be able to detect that fly. And if you spend some time underwater looking at flies that are on the surface, color is not a big factor, especially if there's much light in the sky at all. So um, I feel like black makes a really good silhouette that purple, purple and black are, are much closer colors to a fish's vision than they are to ours. Mm-hmm. Those are colors that they can see in every light condition. And, uh, and then just the contrast with that white wing and that little bit of flash in it, that seems to be a very dynamic fly. And I've used them everywhere between like a size 14, a small size 12, um, up to size fours and caught fish consistently throughout the summer on that pattern so basically by the time the stone flies dwindle out the hoppers are starting to come on and i'm using that same pattern to catch fish yeah so that that is probably the most important dry fly in my box Um, and because it has foam in that big synthetic wing that's a pattern that can withstand a lot of abuse from fish from limbs it can go under the water a lot and come back up and float so for for clients where their time is really valuable Um, You know, you've got four hours to fish. You don't want to be spending any extra time messing around with um, with floating or or desiccant powder shaking your your fly dry. Like if you can just keep that fly fishing, then you can give your client a better experience. For sure. Which is what we're out there trying to do. Yeah, when you run to that and, you know, the stoneflies are getting, the chubbies really come on hard in the last few years. Uh, The chubby Chernobyl. And the foam is becoming just huge in the stonefly game. But the other thing about using that foam is they float high and you can float uh, heavy flies underneath them. So you can still have a tungsten bead that's appropriate um, underneath it and still get deep fishing that fly. They're great for people that are new. You can slap a stonefly down underneath a tree pretty hard and not spook fish. If you get into a place that's a little more pressured, you might want to go to something more like a stimulator that you can land a little softer and maybe not spook fish. But most of the time, you can, the way those things kind of come down, you can hammer them down sometimes and still get fish and then run run a, a good sized nymph underneath them. And the stimulator came from Randall Kaufman, Portland, Oregon, right? I don't know. Pretty sure that's mm-hmm. one of his flies. Mm-hmm. And the chubby Chernobyl, the, the first Chernobyl flies were an ant pattern and they were black and red and they were they were sized up so they were too big for what ants were but it was a pattern that functioned well and the reason it's called chernobyl is like you know play on the chernobyl nuclear disaster where we have this uh, nuclear mutated godzilla ant Um, but now that pattern is has really come across the spectrum and we're starting to see it for for terrestrial patterns for stonefly patterns even for mayfly and And those were pretty much all foam and rubber legs at the time they had a couple little sliders on top and now we've added wings and some people are getting pretty fancy with them now paul i want to talk with you about 
stonefly fishing techniques. So if you've got a stonefly hatch going on, you're starting to see some shucks out on the rocks. You're seeing some bugs on limbs, maybe not flying around too much. What's your technique? How are you going to fish that situation? So go to on something like that, throw a dropper off that thing. You know what, what I mean? What kind of dropper? So you're, you're going to put on like a, a chubby Chernobyl if, if you're sure. dropping, or I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, I like to throw like a Prince or a hair's ear dropper underneath it. Just something, any kind of searching pattern. Um, maybe 24 inches down, 20 inches down, not too deep. You don't want it doing all kinds of funky stuff that'll drag that <clears throat> fly down. You want those fish, they're looking up anyway, and assuming that you're fishing the dry and you're assuming that they're going to see the dry, they're going to be looking up. So if you're fishing a six foot column or something, it's not a big deal to have your fly maybe only 20 inches down. You know, you don't have to be right in their face at that situation because they're going to come up. A lot of times you'll see it, they'll come up and, and try to hit the dry and on the way back down, they'll smash your, your wet fly. Or vice versa. Vice right? versa, yeah. They'll, they'll grab that nymph on the way up to the dry. But uh, dry dropper, it really depends. If, you know, around here, there's a section of the Wallawa where we first start floating from gun club down to about the mouth of the canyon. It's around two miles where, I mean, you're fishing the edges. There's, you know, there's really no runs. You're just fishing edges, kind of like maybe you would over in Montana or whatever. But it's such a straightaway uh, without a lot of structure that sometimes you can only come off maybe 12, 14 inches with your, with your uh, dropper. Versus then you get back down to the canyon where, you know, you got corners and bends and boulders. Maybe you want to drop that thing down a little bit farther. So um, the difference is adjusting to where you're at. Don't just assume that you always put, you know, a dropper 12 inches down. Like some people, you know, you hear them say, oh, I always put it 12 inches down no matter what. 18 well, you, inches. Yeah, whatever. No. You know, you got you to gotta adjust to what's going on. I mean, hell, man, I've put them down as far as three feet, you know, and it's fine. If you got something that's, uh, you know, buoyant enough like a chubby, you know, you, you can drop a, a pretty big fly down underneath it that's catching a lot of current and trying to pull that foam down but just not doing it. And don't mend, you know. Um, you can get away with it a little bit, but I'd rather have you recast. You know, don't dunk that fly. Sometimes if a fly is buoyant enough, yeah, you can throw a little little mend in it, maybe a little stack mend just to continue your drift. But for the most part, if you think you need to mend, recast. That's what I tell my dudes, and it seems to be a lot more effective versus indie fishing where – Indicator fishing with just nymphs, you know, you want to keep that thing, keep that fly line above it and all that. But, uh, yeah, just recast when you think you need to mend. It's a hard thing for people to switch up sometimes, too, because especially throughout the day, if there's, if I've got them nymphing, right, with an indicator and it's mend all day, right? How many times do we say mend when we're guiding people? One million One times million a times, day. right? <laughs> okay, and then all of a sudden you stick a dry dropper on and they want to mend. The first thing they want to do is mend, but they're dunking it, right? Yeah, it's horrible. It's a horrible experience as a guide for for you clients out there that are listening. Like, I don't know what happens, um, but you're you're like a petulant thirteen year old girl where you do the exact opposite of what we've been telling yeah. you to do, and we tell you mend, 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 mend while we're fishing uh, fishing nymphs, and then we put a dry on, and suddenly it clicks. You're like, oh, I'm gonna start mending now, and you just drag your yeah. your gear underwater, yeah. like. Bro, you're killing me. You, you're and, killing me. And, and behind that rock is downstream, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. If if your guide says Where cast you... behind that rock, that means on the downstream side yeah. of that rock. And for whatever reason, um, people hear that and they're trying to do the right thing and they'll cast in front of the rock and they've just got um, more faith in me than they should probably have. Mm. What kind of boat is that? This guy's out here in like a bathtub. With one of the angriest sounding two strokes I've ever heard in my it's life. It's like a little mini Zodiac. It's like I a don't little know. rib almost, yeah. Uh -huh. We're going 1.1 uh, miles an hour and he's barely passing us at wide open throttle. Uh, he's motivated. <laughs> I like this guy. It's yeah. like a three horsepower two stroke. No I, earplugs. I like his spirit. <laughs> yeah. You can see if he doesn't have earplugs. No, I'm just assuming. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Oh, there's some fish. We got some fish at uh, 113 feet deep. Let me tell you what, folks. We can drop the downriggers and go after them. However, comma, pause for effect. They will not eat because it's really cold down there. It's no. not my gear either. So, yeah, we can go down there. Okay, thanks, Kyle. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of how I do it. got some fish coming up on the surface over here. Let's go ahead and bring all these up to, uh, let's say, five or six feet, whatever those numbers you like better. And uh, while you guys are working this. on that, I'll talk about some of my, the green button. Is it plugged in? 
Oh, gotta plug it in. Where's it plug in? Oh, right here. What's what's happening, Paul? So I just want to bring her up to five. Is that what you're saying with yep. this green button? And real as it's coming. My bad. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Dude. I thought this See, was a guided trip. If you have friends there. and they want to come fishing, it's tough to uh, to to kind of bring them in and out of that guide client relationship. Look at that. Perfect. Not bad. Did we get all three of them? No. Oh, this that, one's just right. That one might still be shallow. It's at nine. It's at nine. Let's bring her on up to seven. This is, has you got like a banana weight on this one, James? It does. Let's okay. go ahead and bring it all the way in. All right. There might be a fish on that rod. Negative. You just want to tack it up? Yes, please. Ah. You, you can put it um, in that rod holder on the side of the gunnel right in front of the net. Where's your net at? Right behind you, bro. This guy? Nope. What am I doing? A net, dude. You know what a net looks like. I do. Your left hand is almost touching it. Oh. You want it right here? <laughs> yeah, right next to the net on the gunnel. <laughs> gunnel is also known as the side of a friggin' boat. This guy owns boats. Several of them. <laughs> you can both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Paul. PPS. Poor Paul syndrome. Yeah, what do you want? <laughs> Where were we? I think we were um, talking about droppers. So one thing I'll say about droppers is if it is going to take four seconds for your dropper fly to get down to the depth that it's allotted and you can only get a three-second drift, then you're doing something wrong. So if you have three feet of line out, you probably need to be fishing in a fairly slow section of water to be able to get the benefit of that, unless you're trying to attract a fish by that dropper fly descending. Agree. Yeah, and they do hit them on the way down. I mean, how often have you, you know, you drop that cast and that thing isn't at depth yet, and it'll smash it on the way down, just dropping. You know, and I like that. It's a little bit different kind of take, but uh, you, if you see it enough, you know what you're looking at. So Yeah. What droppers do you like? What's your go-to dropper? Like if you're fishing the ranch, keep it simple. I like a a Prince or a Guide's Choice, and all the nymphs that I use anymore are jig hooks um, with a with a tungsten bead or whatever kind of bead Kyle ties I on there. I tie everything with tungsten. Yeah, unless it's specifically requested to not be tungsten. But those barbless jig hooks, um, they snag so much less. Yeah. They get good hookups right in a fish's nose, which I really appreciate. That's a nice piece of real estate to hold onto a fish, and. There's a smaller chance of damaging the mandibles. It's it's just a good presentation. I also like the the angle of that nymph in the water. You know, it mm-hmm. kind of flattens out. And when I throw a nymph in the water, they kind of arch their back and curve their belly. And they're trying to find that stasis so that they can latch onto whatever they can. And, and, and I think that the jig hooks do a good job of emulating that. So with the dry fly presentation, what angle do you want that dry fly in the current do you want it facing up current cross current down current i don't really care as long as it's not behind the boat trolling dragging with wake on it or out running the boat you know ideally straight up and down just as if you were to hold it out right like that and look at it. that's what i want to do nope, facing nobody can see your hand bro it's a friggin' podcast <laughs> <laughs> straight up and down what? uh up upstre- if you're doing it right upstream what's straight up and down mean I'm right here, and I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, you want it to be doing a tail stand out there somehow? I want it looking like it just landed out of the freaking sky. Yeah, with the wing up. Okay. Straight up. Gotcha. Yeah, so the wing's up. up and down. But you That's don't care which way it's facing. <laughs> <laughs> Can we cuss on this thing? Or <laughs> No. No, we're, we're not explicit. All right. Uh, oh. Straight up and down. So what that means to you that are listening, hook shank parallel to the water. So let it land, let that uh, wing be straight up. And ideally, if you're fishing 45 degrees off the front of the boat, if you're doing it right, and it's not outrunning the boat, you're not seeing a wake behind it to where if you have a dropper on, you should, um, that your dropper's just rising and basically riding right underneath the surface. Um, If you're doing it right, that hook, the eye of the hook should be closest to you, 45 degrees off the boat. Gotcha. Makes sense. I like it to be facing either upstream or cross stream or in between. If it's facing downstream, to me that means that that fly is dragging. Yeah. There's there's very few times that a dry fly can be facing downstream that it's not actually getting pulled downstream. 
even if that movement is difficult to perceive, it's facing downstream because the line in front of it is downstream. So that means that there's a curve in that line coming back to you. And more than likely, if you're fishing, you know, downstream from the boat like you should, then you're probably getting some drag right there. Yeah, you get belly in that line recast. Don't don't try to extend it. Just yeah, recast right I think away. you got I think you got to be a little careful setting um hard and fasts though because there are situations where your current is going to dictate that you got to mend down mm-hmm. and that fly is catching up to that mend and so your fly will be facing down. But in general, if you're fishing the laminate current, that's the current's the same between you and the fly then yeah. Yep. But there's certain situations that so if you're out there and you're you're fishing these don't, you know, we in fly fishing we like to set these rules and then when you're new you hear these rules and you try to follow them and it doesn't it doesn't work in every situation so. no anytime you go from fishing too fast water through slow water vice versa you got to be a little bit more dynamic and adjust and maybe you're just going to be a little bit shorter until that line either slows down or speeds up too much because it's in between you and your target do your best okay if you're in my boat and i tell you a rule it's a rule that works 100% of the time, no matter what Kyle Bratcher <laughs> says. Uh-huh. He's just trying to poison poison your ears in this podcast. Mm-hmm. Real know-it-all. <laughs> <laughs> I still love you, buddy. Don't so, mm-hmm. nymphs. Are we waiting nymphs, or are we waiting the tippet with split shot? You could, um, but... Oh, really? You could. I've seen you do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, a lot. So, typically, I don't throw. If I do tie up, let's say I'm going to fish, there's a couple different things going on. Maybe some mayflies are coming off. Are you going to get to the point here? Yeah. Just let me go. Okay. Okay. Here we go. If you're going to drop it off and and you're just, let's say you're using like a size 8 stimmy, I don't personally around here, I wouldn't be throwing too much in the way of like anything tungsten wrapped. I would probably go with a, a wrapped brass bead and let that thing drop down in there. I a, it, it wrap, a wrapped brass bead. So when you're tying, um, wrapping with lead or synthetic, any kind of mm. extra weight of material on the shank up towards the bead, uh, try to keep it a little bit lighter. Like I said, those fish are looking up, and you do want it kind of dead drifting under the fly like that, but you can get to the point where it's just counterintuitive getting down too far and having too much weight underneath your dry. And if you're not using a bead, you know, there's plenty of flies out there that are, are just wrapped without a bead head but make sure there's some weight on it. Otherwise, it's just going to be, there's so much buoyancy in tying materials. Otherwise, you're not floating at all. You're basically just fishing a second dryer maybe in the surface film. Yeah. yeah. So I, I really like having a light nymph for for bigger nymphs, like a stonefly nymph. I like that that fly itself to be really light because the natural insect is really light. So he's susceptible sure. to all the nuances of, of current, all the subtleties of current that are down near the substrate. Correct. But you've got to get it down there. So I'm adding split shot to my tippet in order to drag that mm-hmm. light material down there and then making sure that it's tied to my tippet in a way that it still allows some movement. There's a fish on that rod. Get him. Get him. Let's get go, him. go, go, go. It's not going to wait all day. Well, I don't know what I'm doing. You got it, Kyle? Yep. You like to use kind you, of you a... You want to net that for him? Where's the net at? Yeah, <laughs> we've been over this. <laughs> you actually got one on. Yeah. Get the net. Jesus Christ, it's probably six inches. No, it's it's not massive. If he gets up on the surface, put your rod tip under the water. Listen to what your guys are telling you. I am. Big bass. And we got Jesus a fish Christ. in the boat. Warm. Nice kokanee. Good job, boys. Um, so moving forward here, we've talked about how to fish nymphs. We've talked about how to fish dries. We've talked about the the life cycle of, of the fish. That's going to need a little bit of bait on it. Jesus Man, Kyle. it's like I'm fishing with my well this is what happens cousin's pe- kids or something that's what happens when people go kokanee fishing with you and never you do anything um that, that so that's a great point if you're out there fishing with with your friends if you've got more experience you're fishing with your wife your kids uh your husband whoever has more experience make sure that you're getting them involved and getting them to do as much as possible otherwise you'll find yourself in a situation like me where your friends <laughs> are putting bait on the wrong hook what'd you do I'm not. I, I don't think. I, jig, I don't think I, I'd edit this. I don't think I'd edit this. I jig for kokanee. Man. What are you doing? So, we fish for kokanee with two hooks, and we only put bait on the top hook. That way, if they short strike and miss, there's a naked hook back there to uh, to get them with. We're learning. Hmm. 
So I don't get super fancy with my droppers. You can do all kinds of weird stuff, but I'll just come off the uh, the bend of the hook on your dry fly straight down. And if I'm in something really shallow, I will use um, a lighter line on my dropper so that if I'm if I know I'm going to be hanging up or bouncing the bottom quite a bit, at least I'm only breaking. If I am going to break off, I'm just breaking the dropper off. Yep. Typically, that's a good you point. Know, either three X two four X or four X two five X, depending on your clarity around here. I don't screw around too much with anything above 5x. Just don't need to. It flows so fast. Unless you're still water fishing, of course, that's a different animal. I won't let somebody fish with anything lighter than 5x unless they have a note from their doctor or their yeah. mom. It's not working. Cow, 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 cow. Rod, line breaking. God damn it. What Dude. is going on? <laughs> we've We've lost all credibility. Now, if you're nymphing, <laughs> are we still talking about this? <laughs> I'm just trying to ease the pain here. This is just, what is going on? Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up. Um, as it turns out, running three three rods, three downriggers, and trying to fish while, uh, while talking about fishing is a little bit more complicated. But we pulled it off. Kyle caught a nice kokanee. We've got him in the got him in the Yeti. Paul netted him after he eventually found the net, which was great. And uh, if you guys have any questions about stoneflies, any questions about how to fish during a stonefly hatch, how to know when a stonefly hatch is going to occur on a certain type of river in a certain location, wherever you are in the world, feel free to get a hold of Paul Pagano at Flyside Angling or Kyle Bratcher at Six Foot Flies. And they're both great resources and are willing to help you out. And then if you need flies to go fish in that location, um, Six Foot Flies can build you those flies. And then if you want to come here and fish and check out our Golden Stone Fly Hatch, which is, you know, my favorite fly fishing time of the whole year, get a hold of Paul at Flyside Angling. He'll take you down the river and uh, you can have a really great experience. Thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening. I hope you learned something that will help you be more successful on the water. I'd also like to thank Kyle and Paul for sharing their knowledge and experience. This podcast was edited by Emily Brannigan, with original music written and performed by Justin Hay. Art for the Six Ranch podcast was created by John Chatelain and digitized by Celia Christofferson. If you enjoyed the show, I encourage you to subscribe and share it with a friend. Catch you later.